Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Don't forget to stay connected, let us know which lessons you like best, and help support the Academy on Patreon. We appreciate you. The purpose of this channel is to make you familiar with the fundamentals of rocket science, so you will have a solid foundation on which to evaluate space flight systems, and perhaps someday, Design your own spaceships, rovers, and robots so that I can retire on the moon when I'm an old man. To that end, while we wait for Integrated Test Flight 3, we are going to think outside the box and explore improving the Starship design by making it a three-stage system. Not by how I usually recommend, which is making the cone deploy from the Starship propellant tanks and fly independently with larger header tanks, but something totally new. We are going to use the basic design of this vehicle, the Chrysler Serve, designed in the 1960s as a hydrogen-fueled, fully reusable, single-stage-to-orbit launch system, to do something really crazy. If you watched this lesson, you learned about how single-stage-to-orbit systems on Earth, using chemical propulsion only, are not very efficient. Chemical rockets using common fuels are limited to an efficiency of about 450 seconds of specific impulse if they use liquid hydrogen fuel. If we could use a nuclear thermal rocket engine, we could double that efficiency to 900 seconds. But we can't use nuclear thermal rocket engines in Earth's atmosphere without putting a lot of people in danger. China just had a falling booster almost land on some houses. And if you watched this lesson, you saw how devastating a rocket's impact in a populated area can be in that country. For our lesson today, we are going to take this massive dome-shaped spacecraft and we are going to combine it with the top part of Stage Zero, trying to build a system that will lift the entire 5,000 metric ton Starship to an altitude of around 50 kilometers. The Starship will then fire its booster and go on into space not having to worry as much about atmospheric and gravity drag. The new Super Stage Zero will then fall back to Earth, where it will land using jet engines. Why jet engines? Because many of you have asked me about using them on a first stage, and I think that combining efficient air-breathing turbofan engines modified to burn methane is really cool. We'll attach them to the outside of the structure, or put them under here as the Chrysler Serve had planned, with Raptor 3 rocket engines around the inner ring to provide launch thrust and create an aerospike effect, boosting their efficiency. Using the turbofan engines, which have a specific impulse of about 4,000 seconds in atmosphere, to assist in getting to altitude and especially to come back and land. Let's do some math. What do we need? to lift 5 million kilograms, plus the mass of our super stage, to an altitude of 50,000 meters, with enough fuel to come back and land. Let's estimate the dry mass of this structure as 250 metric tons, more than twice as heavy as a starship, and almost 50% more than a booster. And let's say we will need 50 metric tons of methane only when we come back to land. Since going up, we will be burning fuel only through the jet engines and fuel and oxidizer through the rafters. Coming back, we will be much lighter, and we might be able to just use the jet engines to slow down and land. If we couldn't or there was a problem, we could save a little liquid oxygen for a short rocket engine burst at the end, a kind of hover slam, like the Falcon 9 booster uses. That might be a more efficient way to bring our super stage back anyway, but we wanted to use jet engines. Okay, let's get to work. So we take the launch mass of the Starship, 5 million kilograms, and we add 250,000 kilograms for the dry mass of what we will call Super Stage Zero, with 50,000 kilograms of reserve propellant at main engine cutoff. That will leave us with 5,300,000 kilograms once it reaches a height of 50,000 meters. Now, how much propellant will we need to burn to get up here? With the understanding that every second of operation, our ship gets tons lighter through mass propellant flow through the engines. And how much force will we need to produce to get off the ground in the first place? 
and how much delta V will we end up with? If we don't know our starting mass, how can we calculate our delta V? And without delta V, how can we calculate our propellant mass? And without propellant mass, how can we know our starting mass? How big should this thing be? It may seem impossible at first, but making a few basic assumptions will let us get the job done. Let's make a torus design so the Starship and Superstage Raptors can fire through the middle, while the jet engines are safely on the outside. If the Starship is 9 meters in diameter and we see that the top of stage 0 is about twice that, we get about 18 meters across. And if the Taurus is 10 meters in circular diameter, it will be a total of 38 meters wide and 10 meters tall. Now we need to calculate the volume of our Taurus. The formula for the area and volume of a Taurus like the one we have chosen is here where capital R is the major radius from the center of the tube here to the center of the torus structure here. That's 5 meters plus 9 meters to 14 meters. And little r, the minor radius, which is the radius of the tube itself, which is 5 meters, shown here. We need volume, so we say the volume equals pi times the radius of the circle squared, simply the area of this circle times 2 pi capital R, which can be simplified to 2 pi squared times big R times little r squared. Putting in our numbers gives us 3,454 cubic meters of volume. For methane-fueled rockets, using liquid oxygen, the relative size of the oxidizer and fuel tanks is almost 50-50. Since we need to get extra fuel for the air-breathing engines, we'll go 60-40 fuel to oxidizer volume. That means 2,073 cubic meters for liquid methane and 1,382 for liquid oxygen. With the density of superchilled liquid methane being about 490 kilograms per cubic meter, and that of liquid oxygen being about 1,250 kilograms per cubic meter, we will get 1,016 metric tons of liquid methane and 1,727 metric tons of liquid oxygen. Adding these together gives us 2,743 metric tons, and we'll round that up to 2,750. We add in the 250 metric ton dry mass, and we get 3,000 metric tons total. Now the total mass of our new Starship launch system, including Super Stage Zero, is 8,000 metric tons. We will need to lift this off the ground and get it to an altitude of 50 kilometers. 8,000 metric tons is 8 million kilograms. Multiplying by 1 g, or 9.807 meters per second squared, gets us a weight of 78,456,000 newtons. Let's start with a thrust to weight ratio of 1.25, a little slower than the usual 1.5 we would use if this system were trying to add horizontal delta V. And we get 98,070,000 newtons of needed thrust. Dividing that by the thrust of a Raptor 3, about 245,000 newtons, and we get 40. So we need 40 Raptor 3s around this inner ring. Each Raptor 3 has a mass of about 1.4 metric tons, so we would use up 56 of our 250 metric tons of dry mass. This ring has a radius of 9 meters, so a perimeter of 56.55 meters gives us 1.413 meters per Raptor. Sea level raptors have a bell nozzle diameter of 1.3 meters, so we are good. We also add jet engines around the perimeter. Which engine will we choose? The GE90-115B might be a good choice. At 8,762 kilograms, it is much more massive than the Raptor 3. And it only has a thrust of 597,000 newtons, giving it a thrust to weight ratio of about 6. Weak, but it uses atmospheric oxygen, making it more efficient. Adding four pairs for redundancy would cost us about 70 metric tons, leaving us with 124 metric tons of dry mass for the rest of the structure. The engines produce a total of 4,776,000 newtons, which is almost 500 metric tons of thrust. That will improve our thrust to weight ratio at launch. If we add 4,776,000 newtons from the jet engines to the 98,070,000 of the Raptor 3s, we get a total thrust of 102,846,000 newtons. Dividing that by the weight of 78,456,000 newtons, we get a new thrust-to-weight ratio of 1.31. Not too bad. 
After separation, our super stage zero should have a mass of about 300 metric tons, like we said, 250 tons of dry mass and 50 of propellant. And since the jet engines can produce a thrust of about 500 metric tons, we should have no problem bringing it down to land. Now let's look at how everything works. The Super Stage Zero lifts off with our Starship and booster on board. It has an initial mass of 8,000 metric tons. The Raptors have an efficiency of 330 seconds at sea level, and with 40 of them at full throttle, we are burning through a little more than 30 metric tons per second. As the mass decreases and we approach an optimal thrust to weight ratio, we can then throttle back the rocket engines, using the jet engines at lower altitudes because they have a higher efficiency. We will then climb high enough for the jet engines to shut down, probably around 10 kilometers at best. Then the Raptors take over completely and continue lifting. If our optimal acceleration is 1.5 g's, we subtract gravity drag and get a real acceleration of 0.5 g's, or about 4.9 meters per second squared. We know that acceleration equals distance over time squared, and by solving for time and putting in our numbers, we see that it will take us 101 seconds to reach 50 kilometers altitude in the acceleration of 4.9 meters per second squared. We had 2,750 metric tons of propellant. But as we climb, we burn propellant mass, allowing us to throttle down the engines, reducing our mass propellant flow. If we reach apogee with a total of 300 metric tons for super stage at Miko, our final mass would indeed be 5,300 metric tons. Assuming an exhaust velocity of 330 seconds, it would actually be a little better up here at lower atmospheric pressure. We would need to burn only 24 metric tons per second. The average between 30 and 24 metric tons per second is 27, times 101 seconds gives us 2,727 metric tons of propellant. Not counting what we saved using the jets. Since we started with 2,750 and with our jet engines increasing efficiency when we need it the most, at the very start, we should have enough propellant for our 50 tons of reserve. Now we can calculate our MECO delta V. Our starting mass was 8,000 metric tons, our MECO mass was 5,300 metric tons, our exhaust velocity was 3,236 meters per second. Remember, we get this by multiplying the specific impulse, 330 seconds, by 1 g or 9.807 meters per second squared. And that gives us a delta V of 1.33 kilometers per second. We use a three tower fallback structure like those used on Soyuz to release and launch the Starship. With the launch zero ring spinning up the outer engines, the booster starts to burn its 3,350 metric tons of propellant, saving 50 metric tons for its own landing. And we send the 300 ton super stage back to land. That takes our mass from 5,300 to just 5,000 tons. And at booster burnout, we get another 3.6 kilometers per second of delta V. At engine shutdown, we have a new mass of 1,650 metric tons. We drop off the booster with its reserve propellant, losing a total of 230 metric tons. Now the Starship fires its engines for hot staging. It's starting with a delta V of 1,333 meters per second from super stage plus 3,588 meters per second from the booster, so about 4.9 kilometers per second. I switch back and forth between meters per second and kilometers per second, not to make you mad or confuse you, but so you will get familiar with the terms. The Starship starts with a mass of 1,420 metric tons and burns 1,150 of its 1,200 tons of propellant. At this altitude, the Raptors have a specific impulse of 380 seconds, or at least the vacuum Raptors do. That gives us another 6,186 meters per second delta V. And if we add those up, we get a delta V of 11,107 meters per second. That gives us a lot of capability. Now we could increase our payload to 250 metric tons and still get to low Earth orbit with delta V to spare. Or we could drop our payload mass to 30 metric tons and send something on a direct trajectory to the moon without needing 15 to 20 refueling flights. Exercises like this can help us know what will be required to get a mission accomplished. It can also teach us to think outside the box. I hope this lesson has helped you understand this process better, and kudos to whoever finds whatever mistake I surely made doing this. Thanks for listening, and stay safe. Ad Astra Proterra. 
Attention all operators on countdown one. This is the final go, no go for flight two of Starship. Again, our T zero is at 7 a.m. Central. Raptor one. Go. Raptor two. Go. Stage one. Go. Stage two. Go. Copy, go for flight. Clock is rolling. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have liftoff. Stage separation. 